Good morning, everyone. How are you doing? Glad to have you here. My name is Bob Morris, and I'm the lucky moderator of today's panel. Um, it's it's going to be a lot of fun, and it's uh, as you're going to see, we've got five panelists here who come at food from all different directions, and and coming up with questions to talk with them about was. Uh, a minor challenge for me. It's kind of like herding cats. So, uh, but it's going to be a lot of fun, and there'll be time, plenty of time for y'all at the end of everything to uh, ask your own questions. We'll have uh, some surprise food treats in between here too. So, uh, first of all, I'd like to thank the folks from Edible Orlando. Where's Kendra Lott, the publisher of Edible Orlando? <coughs> The new issue is out. If you aren't familiar with the magazine, please make yourself familiar with it. It's a great addition to our community. Uh, it really supports local food, local chefs, local farmers, artisans, everything. And uh, it's just, it deserves your support and your readership. So thank you, Kendra. And other folks from Edible Orlando at the table there, or, or Pam, hello. So, but thanks, and then thanks uh, again to the Tiki family too, to, to Sig and Elizabeth. Big loud applause. <laughs> you know, all of us who come here and enjoy films at the Enzian uh, know that good food and good drink go just hand in hand with film. So uh, the addition of this food element <coughs> to the fo uh, film festival in recent years has, has been terrific and well received. So. Thank you, Tiki's. We appreciate it. Um, okay, let's get things rolling here. What I'm going to do is go down the line and introduce each one of our panelists one by one, and then ask them each a, a, a little question. And at, then at the very end, uh, we're going to have a surprise uh, food treat, and then we'll kind of get back to the topic at hand. So uh, there's no telling what's going to happen next. Um, our, our first one, we'll start at this end, Guy Alanat, Alanat. Um, he was born and trained in France, uh, but he's now based in the Tampa Bay area, where he is a culinary instructor and uh, through his company, the mastermind behind some of the region's most sought after high-end events and private parties. He's also the author of two acclaimed books, The Chef's Repertoire, hold it up Guy, and um, Molecular Cuisine, 20 Techniques, 40 Recipes. Uh, so what I'll be asking everybody is, so Guy, it's your last day on planet Earth. And today? today's your last day on planet Earth. Uh, what, what will be your final meal? Who will cook it for you? And who will your, your table mates be? Um, well, I, I'm not sure I, w I would I would want to eat uh, <laughs> if <laughs> if that was my last day on Earth. But um, I don't know. The the, the um, you know I kind of like to think that uh, I would like to uh, spend my time with famous people or you know uh, interesting uh, famous people. But um, I think the truth is that I would like to spend that with uh, uh, with family probably and. Um, uh, I'll probably spend it with my wife and um, maybe my mother, who would cook too. She would cook. What yeah. would she cook you? Uh, something rustic, just just like just like her. <laughs> um, something that would be um, uh, maybe from the south of France. Um, um, you know, some 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 braised lamb shanks. Um, something that has cooked for a long time. Um, you know, just some very rustic, old-fashioned recipe. Um, no molecular cuisine. Not that I don't like it, but just because uh, um, if it's my last day on Earth, then it's got to be something. You know, we, we, we are um, uh, primates, right? And we, we, uh, we like to go back to, to what we know. So if it's my last day, um, I need to go back to what I know, and that's, um, and that's mommy's cooking. <laughs> <laughs> I should point out that that Guy's something of a newlywed to his wife, Carissa, is right here too. So, yeah, big wave there. All right, he he shouted out to you. Please see note that. See you up there. <laughs> <laughs> Chad Galliano grew up in the Bayou area, Bayou area of southern Louisiana, 
which instilled in him the uh, Cajun Southern appreciation of all things edible. He trained at Johnson and Wales, cooked in the southwestern U.S. and uh, New Orleans and throughout the country, and ultimately married his Taiwanese wife. Where is she? She sure was. Is see. she inside? <coughs> She's there somewhere. Which introduced him to a whole new uh, food <laughs> world as well. He's now the, uh, a chef at Trump International Beach Resort in Miami, and the man behind the food blog known as Chadzilla. Uh, Chad Galliano, what would what would be your last meal on the face of the earth, and who would cook it, and who would be seated at your table? My first, my, my first answer was going to be uh, some like 72-hour sh short ribs, so I can buy myself more time. But um, <laughs> I think I have to agree with Guy that. Um, Obviously, with food, you know, why you can think of lots of famous people or great chefs or celebrities you like to cook for, but ideally it would just be for family and friends, you know, and I'd probably do something simple, something you eat with your hands, like a, like a Louisiana crawfish boil or a crab boil or something. You spend all day drink, sitting outside eating, drinking beer, you know, talking, having fun. That's really what food's all about, so I, nice. keep, I keep going full circle to that. Sign me up. That sounds good. Not that I want you to pass this veil anytime soon, so. Thanks. Uh, Martha Hall Foose. I could sit up here and tell story after story here. Um, she comes from Mississippi where her family has a plantation named Pluto. There's a story in that. <laughs> she went to pastry school in France and apprenticed at the famed La Brea Bakery in LA. There's a story in that. <laughs> She's served as food editor for Pillsbury Classic Cookbooks, run her own bakery, and more recently has found a place for all her many stories in um, screen doors and sweet tea, recipes and tales from a southern cook, which won a James Beard Award. And um, more recently, a southerly course, traveling foodways close to home. Um, Martha, what the hell would you eat? Oh. Um, I'm a big brunch fanatic like that's my favorite meal is brunch so it would be very sausage and bacon intensive um, breakfast with maybe beignets some cheese grits nice fruit salad uh, and mimosas or milk punch and mimosas okay good that's a perfect way to put it on there Jeff Potter a self-described science and food geek he is the author of Cooking for Geeks, Real Science, Great Hacks, and Good Food. He is a much sought after um, speaker and has appeared on NPR, the Today Show, Food Network, Cooking Channel. And he's a trustee and spokesperson for Awesome Food and the Awesome Foundation, which among other things, awards monthly uh, micro grants for, for those doing good deeds and advancing food frontiers. When I visited uh, Jeff's blog, one of the most interesting things I saw, and maybe he'll talk about it at some point, is how you make homemade ice cream in 30 seconds. It involves nitrogen. I won't, I won't go beyond that. But Jeff, what, what would be your last meal on, on Earth here? I didn't see that question coming. <laughs> uh, I think for me it's probably the same as everybody else. You know, foods that remind me of my childhood. So in my case, it happens to be um, really good German chocolate cake from the bakery down the street. My dad's apricot jam that he made. Um, I mean, it's, it's just those things that remind me of childhood. And I think it's probably universal. So, you know, we, we look at food. It's our connection to our history. It's our connection to our culture. So it's the uh, you know, last day on planet Earth. You know, hopefully I'm off to some other interesting planet that's got good food. Um, <laughs> but, you know, I, I would say things that remind me, remind me of my childhood. Our uh, fifth and last panelist, uh, has been working professionally in kitchens since he was 16. Uh, he's a graduate of the CIA. He worked in top restaurants all over the world. You know him as a finalist on Top Chef, I think, from season two, and as one of the Top Chef all-stars. He's been host of Marcel's Quantum Kitchen on Sci-Fi. Among his many current endeavors is his company Modern Global Tasting, which aims to bring the uh, future of gastronomy to uh, restaurants, themed events, private events. And he's also one of the creative minds, uh, along <coughs> with Haru Kishi. Where's, where is he? 
He Haru's, was, uh, yeah. Haru's setting up the uh, okay. tasting portion. He's, he's working. I was he's working the right now. Get back but to he's work, here. Haru. But he's one of the co-conspirators <laughs> uh, conspirators behind their uh, occasional pop-up restaurant in L.A. known as The Coop, which is uh, um, a restaurant, shall we say, that uh, is very egg-centric. So uh, Marcel will briefly tell about us about his famous favorite last meal, and then he has a food presentation to make, too. So go for it. Um, my last meal, I mean, I'm kind of in the same boat with you. I think the 72-hour short rib, Chad, was a great idea. I think uh, trying to prolong it as long as possible would be a, a great never-ending pasta bowl, maybe some sort of, like, you know, all-you-can-eat buffet and just keep on rocking it out. And like, I'm still hungry. <laughs> Shoveling it in spoon after spoon. Um, no, but I, I, I'm going to go ahead and agree with uh, everything that everybody else has said and say that I would, I'd like to have my last meal be something um, nostalgic, something that would remind me of my childhood. Um, and when I was growing up, <clears throat> my mom was a, not really a professional chef, but a great, a great home cook. Um, and on my birthday, she was always, you know, she would always cook me whatever I wanted. And so I um, <clears throat> was growing up in the Pacific Northwest and like near Seattle. So I kind of developed a steep appreciation for Dungeness crab. So I always kind of like, you know, love having just a boiled like crab with lemon and butter and just breaking it down, you know, getting all kind of carnivorous with it. And um, so I'd pro that would probably be it. Super simple, just Dungeness crab, um, steamed or boiled, you know, not, not super fancy. And uh, butter, lemon. Maybe some rice. I want to like, you know, have some starch, something to fill me up. But I think that's pretty much it. Um, something that I kind of grew up with. Something that you know I really enjoy eating. Um, maybe throw some uni on there or something. But um, Marcel, pretty, I think your food is coming out. No, I don't think that's is that it. No, those are tacos. Oh. <laughs> oh, I saw people bringing things out. But do you, uh, pardon me. Oh, okay. Yeah, um, so we just wanted to provide like a little, little bit of a, a kind of like a tasting portion, um, something that represents uh, modern cooking, um, and so we actually came up with an olive, like a black olive sphere. So uh, it's a process called spherification, which is basically a, um, it's a controlled jellification that happens between, it's, it's a re reaction that happens between two chemicals, um, one of them being sodium alginate and the other one being uh, calcium gluconolactate. So when the salt comes into contact with the calcium, it essentially creates like a jello. Um, so it gives it like a thin exterior membrane, and then the inside is just kind of like, you know, uh, juice, olive, olive water, essentially. Um, we put in a little bit of gold and a little bit of silver, so kind of like sparkles and shimmers. Um, and just, you know, spare no expense here at the Florida Film Festival. I want to do something nice for you guys. Sprinkle a little gold on top. Um, yeah, and so essentially what we did is we actually just juiced cocktail olives and strained it through a super bag to just extract the water. And this particular spherification is a reverse spherification, so we added um, the calcium gluconolactate into the olive water with um, a little bit of squid ink, actually, to make it black, because I actually used green olives for my black olive sphere, which doesn't make any sense whatsoever, but that's what we decided to do. Um, and yeah, should be... Should be coming out any <coughs> any second. <coughs> um, but yeah, just a little just a little tasty treat. Uh, it's a little early for olives, um, but I hope you guys enjoy it. Kind of briny, kind of salty. Well, so 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 that you aren't surprised when that comes out. That's what's coming to you. And there's little technique cards that'll come with it. You can go home and try this. <laughs> Maybe not. Okay. Chew, chew with your mouth closed. Yeah. Be careful. <laughs> They all right, will, all right. They here, here they come. So they'll be circulating throughout here as we go ahead and, and, and speak through their service and everything. Um, I'm going to go down the line and, and ask each one of our panelists um, a question that will just let them explain a little bit uh, more about themselves and, and what they do. Guy, I know you, you teach um, a lot of culinary <laughs> classes, and, and one of the things that you impress upon your students is to always try new and different foods. Like one of the things that you do, you give extra credit to your students if they will go to the public supermarket and get head cheese 
and photographed themselves eating it. Video, video, yeah. Uh, 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 which I think is wonderful. But sometimes that backfires on you because they, they bring food in for you to eat. So uh, can you maybe talk about one of the things that was presented to you yeah, recently? They, they, um, they don't bring me anything. Uh, I mean, they haven't until, uh, until last week. But that's true. Um, one of the things that I try to, uh, to uh, emphasize uh, in my, my classes is to, um, to try to give a taste to uh, culinary students. Um, they're young, you know, they're, they're, you know, between 16 and 18. And um, um, I try to, uh, you know, to broaden their horizon a little bit, you know. And, um, and yes, you know, I can give them some, uh, some uh, extra credit is um, when, we, um, when we walk. For example, one of the things that we did is uh, I've ordered um, uh, three whole pigs, and uh, uh, we butcher them, um, fabricate them, and then we use the whole pig because that was the point of the lesson. You know, there's nothing that you can throw away in a pig. You can use everything, and uh, we go ahead and, and we make um, um, head cheese, um, which is not a cheese at all, by the way. Um, but uh, they're completely disgusted by the idea of eating, um, you know, uh, the cheeks or the ears or anything like that. So uh, I do give, that, give them extra credit if they go to Publix uh, and uh, order, for example, uh, head cheese and, you know, they take a little video of themselves. Um, um, and the point here is really to, to talk about um, what other culture m might be um, doing, you know. I mean, I grew up eating uh, head cheese. Um, in France, you know, uh, not only that, but uh, <laughs> that was that was part of the of the things that I've tried, and um, and last week they they, they um, I mean they you know they kind of mad at me to 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 force them to eat that kind of thing for um, extra credit, um, but some of them do it, some don't, and uh, last week I had um, I had a student um, uh, whose family is uh, Vietnamese and. Um, and he brought me uh, balut. Uh, balut, for those who don't know, is um, it's a chicken uh, embryo, and uh, uh, it looks like an egg. Uh, it is an egg, and um, it's a little heavier than a normal egg, egg you know. And uh, um, you know, as you open it, there's a, um, there is a a, uh, a chicken embryo in it. So. Um, uh, they put me on the spot there, and they said, "Okay, now we're going to give you extra credit if you eat that thing." You know, <laughs> and um, and uh, every part of my body wanted to to you know back out and 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 you know tell them to shut up and go to the the next lesson. But um, uh, I thought I would earn a little a little street cred there, you know, <laughs> and um, um, walk walk on my swag, like they say, you know. And uh, so I had to eat it, and uh, and um, and you're here to tell the tale. Uh, barely, barely, <laughs> barely. Did you like it? Uh, did I like it? Um, no, 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 no. Uh, I, I didn't like it. I didn't like it. Um, you know, I, I like the experience because um, because it's uh, um, you know I just couldn't not do it. You know because you know I cannot tell them to eat head cheese. And and then when they bring me something, say, oh no 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 no, I really don't do that, you know. So so I did eat it, and you know if you want to know, it's a, it's a, maybe a cross between a um, you know between a, a raw oyster um, and uh, uh, Jeff was talking about it last night, uh, maybe a, a soft sh soft shell uh, crab, you know, the texture like you know soft and then a little crunchy. And uh, I mix had with one. <laughs> mix with something like uh, really really foul, you know. It's just very <laughs> um, not very good. But yeah. For for Chad, I know. Uh, talk to us a little bit about your your Chadzilla blog and uh, and how more chefs and and food folks are uh, blogging to create communities and and certainly why you got this one started and and what purpose it serves. Um, well, in the beginning, it was, excuse me, I, and I checked the exact date I started, I cannot remember. It was somewhere between four or five years ago, and um, the other chef I was working with, Curtis Jantz, we, you know, try, always wanted to learn new things, and I mean, I believe if you're doing something, you can't continue learning, then there's really no point in it, so 
all of a sudden there was this modern cuisine we'd been kind of reading about and searching for a few years and, and these techniques coming out, you know, people talking about making hot ice cream. Well, how can you make hot ice cream? Ice is not hot. And different things like that. So we started searching the internet and there's really not a whole lot of information or no books out there. You can get the LBOE books. He was doing a lot of this information, but not really giving away the techniques or the recipes. And um, so a lot of it was just trying with the little information we had and then trial error. Um, we decided we were going to start a blog, Curtis was the executive chef, so he didn't have a lot of time, so as chef de cuisine, I decided, well, I'm gonna take this on myself, I like to write, and just kind of write about our failures and experiments, and after a while, you know, it, it, I started to get, you know, comments and emails from different chefs across the country, and, 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 um, and in other countries also, where, you know, I've tried this too, or, or I've done this and I've succeeded, or I've done this and I've failed, and so it just became this, like, dialogue between, um, a lot of chefs out there where in the past, you know, you work for a different mm -hmm. chef and he would teach you his recipe and maybe they wouldn't tell you all the secrets and it was kind of, I think the chef community just changed around that time where it was more or less um, chefs instead of closing things up and worried about how many experience points you had or, or, or your, how many initials you have after your name on your jacket. It was more about just information, just cooking. <coughs> That's really all it should ever be about is just cooking and learning and, and trying to get better. I mean, if you could do things and you could cook something one way, why not try to learn to do it you know, 10 other different ways also. It, it just makes all the sense in the world to me. So as soon as we started this dialogue and just kept it humble and, you know, keeping that as the basis for it, just, we just share and, and accept information. And it kind of grew and I was, you know, even to this day, I'm, I'm amazed how many pe people come up to me and say, I've been reading your blog or I've read your blog back then. And, you know, it's really cool and thank you. And I mean, it's just, it's just my, it never stops to blow my mind, you know, how many chefs out there are just, you know, willing to just share information, learn and just, embrace the idea of cooking and, and the passion of cooking. And I think this is really all it should be about, if it, whether it's modern cuisine or traditional, and it's becoming so intermingled now where, you know, you may eat something somewhere and you may say, I don't like molecular cuisine or modernist food, but those techniques are coming in, you know. Um, you may not know it's there, it may be transparent, but maybe the chef is using it, maybe he's cooking the sous vide or, or using a little hydrocolloid that you maybe haven't heard of here or there, and it makes the food a little bit better, but if you don't know it's there, it doesn't matter. It doesn't have to be all like smoke on the plate and, and mirrors and powders and foam. It can be that, but if it makes the dish better, then great. If it doesn't, then, you know, then don't do it. You know, that's the point. But you should learn the old techniques and the new. Like I said, you know, it's just constantly growing and learning and, and, and increasing your, your language and, and your repertoire, actually. Um, I think that's really what keeps me going every day. You know, we work in a resort and um, sometimes it's really hectic, but we get to learn these techniques and try to make the food a little better or make it a little more streamlined, more consistent, whatever it is, and just the results are amazing. When people just, just you know, even if you cook a traditional food or not, if, as long as the guest eats it and, and they like it and, and you get the compliments, and that's really what it's all about, pretty much. Thanks, Chad. Um, okay, <clears throat> here's a quote from one of Martha's books. It, it comes from a casino in Biloxi and how she wound up there. And she wrote, <laughs> cards are not my thing, and I like gawking at people. So roulette seemed the best game for me. When the croupier, Twayla, set the ball to spinning, it hopped off the wheel, missing the 38 pocket, and went right down the front of my blouse. <laughs> the guy next to me asked my bra size, <laughs> and it came up on the next spin. <laughs> so, what the heck is this doing in a food book? Uh, I, Martha, talk a little bit about what's, what's important, the story or the recipe? Um, I think and is that, is that story true? Yes, okay. it, it's true, and it's Twyla. Twyla, okay. Um, uh, it's for a recipe for Oysters Casino is the point of it. And my poor, long-suffering editor, um, initially when, I, when I'm working on my books, I, I send my editor a list of the recipes that I want to include. And in all of my recipes, I give him a little subtitle for what the story is going to be about. And so for um, the mashed potato recipes, it's subtitled James Brown and His Fabulous Flames because I was using purple sweet potatoes that were the exact color of James Brown's cape, the first concert I saw for James Brown, and he moved to Florida and recorded Do the Mashed Potato Under an Assumed Name um, with the, uh, Nat Kendrick and the Swans, who Kendrick was the drummer. Anyway, so they all, stories all seem to relate to the recipe to me. Um, 
like I have a catfish recipe and the subtitles about Crown Victoria's uh, cars. Um, and to me, they all tie in together. I mean, in this day with everybody in their smarty pants phone, if they want a recipe for blueberry cobbler, you know, in um, two seconds, they can have 9,000 blueberry cobbler recipes. But to me, it's really important to give the recipes context. And um, in both of my books, People have this idea about Southern food that it's like a John Grisham movie and we're just swatting, scratching, and fanning 12 months out of the year <laughs> eating nothing but chicken and biscuits. And that it, we stopped evolving in 1962. And so I really like to give context that we think about more than just, you know, issues in 1962. I was the um, food stylist for the film The Help that came out last year. And to me, the food, I did not make the pie. <laughs> because I was like, in my line of work, I don't want to be known as the shit pie girl for the rest of my life. But the rest of the food I made. Um, and, and that was another example of really that story is so food driven. And regardless of the fact that a lot of the food we made, you know, ended up on the cutting room floor, I think it really provided the actors a sense of of place and with and with both of my books I think having a story and giving the food a sense of place is is really important and and also I think it helps dispel a lot of the southern myths um, that that we're saddled with so much I don't know if that answered the question no, you did and you took a nice roundabout way to get there too so that's that's <laughs> the that's the beauty of your work and your writing oh. and I, I I recommend her work to all of y'all get her books get all their books um, Jeff Mr. Food Science Geek I hate to say that but since that's what you call yourself then, <laughs> then I'll, I'll go with it but you know there's so much talk in the food world in you know in our society today about certainly the ethics and the morality and 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 what goes in the food what what's your role in, in separating some of this the the science of food how do you approach things uh it's a excellent question and a very long answer <laughs> i'll try to summarize it in two minutes or so um ooh, where to start <laughs> you know our, our our food system in this country is incredibly complicated and I think as Americans, most of us, maybe not in this room, but most, of, most Americans are pretty divorced from the process of farm to table. You know, they go to the grocery store, they pick something up, and they don't really know where it comes from. Uh, and, you know, as the curtain kind of gets pulled back on occasion with how the industrial process works, I think a lot of people get really surprised to find out just how industrialized a lot of it is. And a lot of questions come up. So, you know, a couple weeks ago, the whole pink slime thing came up. And there were a lot of questions about, you know, what is this? Do we want this? Um, wait, wait, look. Do y'all know what? <coughs> it's a great time yeah. to mention. Do y'all know what pink slime is? Have you guys heard of pink slime? Yeah. Okay. Okay. So, you know, pink slime is something that, you know, came up. It actually, you know, came up first, I think, in 2001, 2002, when the FDA, uh, the USDA, actually approved the process. You know, it's been, it's been around for uh, over a decade. And it kind of, you know, the New York Times did an expose on it in the 2008, I think. Um, it, it's one of these things that it's an industrial process. You know, from a science point of view, it's actually safe. From a social acceptability and ethics point of view, maybe we don't want it in our food. Um, but a lot of the uh, criticisms that, that uh, it comes under um, come from a from a point of view that are misinformed in the science and. I guess in, when I look at food stuff, I mean, you know, my role kind of is to explain the science of it, to say, hey, here's how this stuff works from a science point of view, so that you can go off and have the conversation about social acceptability, ethics, do we want to do it this way or not? But without understanding the science and understanding what's happening, um, you know, before you go into that grocery store to buy the food, you can't really get a good understanding of, you know, if you want to actually, you know, eat food that's prepared that way or not. Um, it, it's a it's a complicated topic, and it's one that I haven't yet really figured out a good way of explaining easily or and speaking about. Um, but it's one that I think is really really important, especially going forward in the next you know few decades when we start looking at a lot of the food supply issues that this country is going to have coming down the road. Um, so I mean, it's it's a different side of of the um, of the story from a, from the food world point of view, but it's uh, an important one. And yeah, I, I'm. 
I am excited, I am anxious, I'm scared, I don't know how to communicate some of this stuff, but at the end of the day, you know, the science is there just to say, hey, here's how this works. It's, it's not there to say how we should be doing things. Um, that's really outside the purview of science, um, but you have to understand the science to be able to have those conversations. So that's kind of where I want to be helping people understand stuff. And Jeff does a great job of explaining this in his book and his, uh, in his ongoing blog, uh, uh, addressing all of these issues there. Okay, Marcel, maybe, uh, so did everybody get some of Marcel's special treat here? <laughs> we, we're still waiting up here, so uh, we'll, we'll come to that. But, but Marcel, maybe now, is, uh, maybe now is a good time to throw this question out here, and, and you, can, you can go at it first, and then, um, and then other folks can and chime in on it too. But you seem the perfect candidate for this. Can someone make it in the food world these days simply by being a great chef? Or must they blog, write books, date supermodels, appear on reality TV, and have the backing of a uh, deep-pocketed venture capitalist? Um, I, think that, um, I think that the answer is yes, if I understand the question correctly. Um, yeah, no, I think that... Um, I think that a chef can totally make it um, in today's world as long as they have like love and passion for what they do. Um, I don't think you need to, you know, be tweeting or Facebooking or whatever the other lists on their dating supermodels. I'm not even sure how that would help you as being a chef, but <laughs> they probably don't eat a lot. Um, <laughs> But no, I mean, those are, I think those are like tools of the trade and it definitely will help you like establish a brand and create kind of like, I don't know, um, a demand I think for maybe your, for your cooking. Um, and they're kind of just like tools of the trade that I think you can utilize as a chef. And I think those tools are increasing in popularity um, more so over the, you know, the past couple decades with, you know, people like Danny Kay, Julia Child, um, Emeril Lagasse, you know, Bobby Flay, any of those celebrity chefs um, that have all kind of, you know, taken us from being in the back of the house and, you know, cooks and chefs were just like down in the dungeon, you know, feeding people and all of a sudden now it's like, you know, food is kind of hotter than it's ever been and um, chefs are becoming at the forefront and people are curious where their food is coming from, whether it's, you know, um, from a farm or from a grocery store or, you know, from a small chef in some little island in the San Juans or, you know, some major celebrity chef in some multi-million dollar casino in Las Vegas. Um, but I think at the same time, people are curious, you know, who is the person that's creating this food and, you know, who, you know, who made this dish that's in front of me? Like, I want to kind of, like, associate this plate with, you know, the person that's making it because I think that, you know, I food is an extremely intimate uh, medium, you know, I mean, as chefs, we're literally creating things that people are going to put inside of their bodies, you know, for, for sustenance and for energy. Um, so any anytime you have that exchange, I think that it's an extremely intimate thing, you know, and as chefs, essentially, not only are we like giving love to like our ingredients, you know, by treating them properly and trying to source the most amazing apple and making sure that we use vitamin C so it doesn't oxidize and, you know, serving it while it's fresh or compressing it or impregnating it or just actually slicing it. Um, you know, there's a million different things you, you can do with it, but, you know, we're kind of like treating that ingredient with love and respect, but also by doing so, um, you know, treating our guests with, with love and respect. And I think that if, you know, as a chef, if you have that mentality and you have that drive and that passion, that that's the most important thing because, you know, it's a long, hard road being a chef. You got to peel a lot of potatoes. <laughs> you got to spend a lot of time in the kitchen, a lot of burns, a lot of cuts, um, and a lot of, you know, hard hours. But I think that at the end of the day, if you have that, then that's basically all you need to be successful. And then, you know. Well, let's, uh, thanks, that's, that's great. That's right on point. Uh, the topic, overall topic for this panel is, uh, oh, good, we get stuff, uh, is the digital dish and, and how, be careful, those balls will explode in your mouth. You know. <laughs> that sounds That's what so you dirty. Say to all the girls. <laughs> <sighs> you no said comment. it. No, no comment. <laughs> Could you have vodka spirit to go with it? Yeah, I think it needs it needs vodka for sure. 
Uh, what, what were we talking about there? Uh, <laughs> exploding balls. Uh, <laughs> and vodka, apparently. Hey, well, since our topic is allegedly the digital dish and how uh, social media and, and modern technology and everything. Martha, you got is, a little bit right, right there. Uh, is serving the food world. <laughs> do, uh, uh, why don't some of y'all chime in on what Marcel was talking about and how you uh, use and are served by or perhaps tormented by uh, social media. I know that um, Martha has special insight into this. <laughs> <laughs> I, um, our farm is it's like 17 miles to a gallon of milk from my house. And so I live a really very distance um, uh, from a lot of the hullabaloo. And my editor said to me, Martha, the silence from you on Twitter is deafening. <laughs> Which is the strangest thing anybody's ever said to me, and I didn't really understand what it meant. And two of my girlfriends thought it would be real funny after they had had some cocktails to put me on Twitter. And then they sobered up and realized that I'd be really mad, and so then they continued to tweet as me for about two and a half months before they kind of finally came clean about um, that they had been tweeting me. Um, I, 140 characters is a, maybe it's just I'm long-winded southerner, but um, I just don't have the knack for it. You know, I think um, I'm much, I'm a more of a 1200 word is my ultimate best best link for things. Um, and the same thing with the Facebook uh, deal. My, finally, my publicist was like, gun to the head, you've got to get on Facebook. And, and it's a strange medium and really weird because I mean, I live in a town that's really small. Um, I'm, uh, most of my dealings with my friends are, you know, the five people that I see every day. And so, you know, to have these 2,700 people that are your friends, um, you know, I, mostly the Facebook page for me is like, so my son's grandparents can see what he's doing and what his outfit was for the school play and, and not very markety of, of my work, which is probably why I'm so poor. Um, <laughs> but it's, it's weird that I love reading blogs and and it's been great for book sales and stuff because I'm written about quite often and so I think it's the whole digital dish stuff serves me well to be written about but it's not something that I've jumped into putting myself out there in, in that way I mean um, it's strange for when my first book came out it just came out as a physical book and didn't come out as an ebook until last year. And a Sudley course, when it came out, it came out in as an ebook and as an actual book book. And um, that's been really strange. And, and it's also, you know, a bummer because probably 95% of my book is available online for free. That somebody can just take your whole book and post it out there, and you don't get a dime. And and so, you know, it's a double-edged sword. Sure, you sell a lot more books, but what's the point in buying my book if you can just, you know, go to food.com and download the thing for free? You know, so it's a... What, what was that website? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I guess I probably come at it from the exact opposite side of reality since my background, I have a computer science degree. Um, <laughs> You know, Twitter is one of those things that I didn't really understand, and like you, my publisher said, you know, hey, you need to start tweeting. I, I think it wasn't until, well, there's actually two funny stories. One, one has to deal with the city of Pittsburgh. I had landed at the airport, was taking the shuttle into Pittsburgh, and I tweeted out, oh, oh Pittsburgh, you know, your, your buses leak, really? It was a rainy day, you know, the little ceiling and the, you know, escape hatch and the bus was leaking. And about two minutes later, the official city of Pittsburgh Twitter account replied back saying, so sorry, what bus number and route, please? <laughs> and it's kind of like, is this thing on? Oh, yeah, I guess it is. Um, the other funny story was, um, 
You know, you're actually talking about online books. Go uh, Google Books is actually great. If you're trying to find kind of esoteric information, um, Google Books is fantastic because it indexes the inside of all the books. And if you just go to Google normally and search, you don't get Google Book results. But if you go to books.google, you do. And this is one book. It's the Handbook of Food Engineering, Science, and Technology. It's like 3,400 page long, you know, Elsevier publication. And it's, it's wonderful, and I, I tweeted out saying, you know, oh, handbook of blah, 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 you know, will you ever be mine? And about 15 minutes later, somebody sends, you know, a link to me, and I'm like, huh. Um, there is this whole, you know, issue of online content versus paid books. I think at the end, end of the day, you know, if you're looking at Twitter, you're looking at Facebook, or you're looking at a book, it really comes down to community. You know, what it's about is fostering community and getting your message out there and really actually starting a dialogue and a conversation. And so the thing about Twitter and Facebook that's it's so wonderful is that it becomes a two-way conversation. You know, with the book, you basically submit your, your docs to your publisher and, you know, that's, you know, at least in my naive version of it, that's kind of the last you hear of it. But, you know, with Twitter and Facebook, it becomes this conversation back and forth. Um, and there have been times when I've blog posted out, you know, hey, does anybody have any good stories about food coloring? And I'll get responses that are things that I wouldn't expect, you know, stories about how somebody's little brother is allergic to certain dyes, um, or stories about, you know, like actually my sister reminded me when I was a kid, she used to put food coloring in the cookie dough to keep me from eating it out of the fridge, because apparently green cookie dough must not taste good, at least, you know, it, she says it works on me as a kid. Um, so, I mean, it, it comes down to looking at what's what's the purpose of, you know, your work in terms of getting the message out there, and, and books are, you know, a one-way medium, whereas Twitter and Facebook, you know, it really brings it much more into conversation. Um, and with, with respect to, you know, 95% um, you know, of the book being available on, on wherever, I kind of look at it and think, you know, if it's about community, you know, it's about getting the message out there. And if there's people who are going to download my book and not buy a copy, but they're still downloading it and reading it, that means that they're engaging and thinking about the issues, thinking about the science, thinking about how stuff works, and, you know, that's fantastic. And if they come to understand that it really is about community, you know, they'll want to support me and my work and go and buy a copy. So, you know, if somebody goes and downloads a copy and looks at it and go, hey, this is pretty good, and, you know, they do the right thing and they go buy a copy, well, you know, that's fantastic. But if they don't and they still get through the, the book in some form, you know, at least they're thinking about the ideas. And if they engage with me, that's even better. So, you know, it's, um, it's a brave new world. One, one thing I found interesting that I got in this, you know, instant message, instant all, everything, I got a letter that was addressed, Martha Foos, General Delivery, Yazoo City, Mississippi. And the thought that today that you can actually get a general delivery letter was, I mean, that was like so great and special that somebody had just randomly sent that out message in a bottle out there, so on the opposite extreme. Yeah. Gee, Chad, do you all have anything to chime in on, on that front? I think I started on Twitter kind of early, or at least I think I did as soon as I heard about it. It may have been out for a while, but um, with blogging is one thing. I mean, you know, aside from blogging information, a lot of chefs have a lot of opinions on things, and I've done a few posts in the past where I've written my opinion on certain things, and you know, the good, the upside of it is the sharing and, and the, the chef community with the information and everything. But the other side is, as soon as you get online, you realize there's a lot of negativity out there, and you get some negative comments. Um, one thing is, I don't know if anyone knows, like, um, from South Louisiana, so another word for a Cajun, more like derogatory type term is a coon ass, and I remember I did a post and I wrote somebody being a coon ass or something, and I got comments from people calling me a racist, thinking in a whole different way, and, and then, <laughs> which I didn't understand. I tried to defend it. I'm like, wait, you don't understand. And then, um, but I find, like, being on Twitter has allowed me to put my foot in my mouth at a much quicker rate, you know, and, <laughs> um, and I have a few times, so, and once it's out there, you can't take it back, so it's, it's kind of, it's kind of, good and bad in a sense like that, it, it kind of keeps it honest, I guess, in a way. But I'm not saying it's all honest, it's a lot of dishonesty. But as far as the 140 character thing, I think what's interesting, a lot of chefs out there um, have what they call Twitter recipes, and there's like recipes you can write in 140 characters or less. And I think with modern cuisine, it works really great. Um, if anyone's familiar with Will Gofarb, he's, he's an amazing um, pastry chef, but much more than that. He has a whole line of like hydrocolloids and everything, and a really smart guy, brilliant chef. And um, he, he sells his line of hydrocolloids, and um, he's, he's also on Twitter, and he's done like recipes kind of help people use them, where, you know, so many grams of this, so many grams of that. And he doesn't really give you the whole technique behind it, but you know, you're supposed to kind of figure it out in your head. And I think it's kind of interesting. It leaves a lot of room open for learning new things, but also making mistakes, which, you know, make you learn more. I think you learn more from your mistakes sometimes than from getting things right. If you got everything right the first time, every time, you really would, you think you'd be smart, but you really wouldn't be that smart, I guess, because you wouldn't be learning much about what not to do, so. 
that's kind of my opinion on the Twitter thing. I still do it. I, I don't understand these chefs that like, um, if you're a chef and, and you're actually you know the chefs work in the kitchen and they tweet something out every 15 minutes, I really don't understand how they have the time to do that because I don't, you know. And I think my reading, like I have a, a lot of people follow my Twitter timeline and usually I sit in the morning when I drink my coffee or late at night, that's the only time I really check it. But you know, I used to be kind of religious at first about trying to catch out everything that everybody was saying. But if you, if you get caught up in it too much, there's a point where you have to let, kind of just let go and say, all right, I'm, I'm, I'm pushing all this away from me and just focus on what I really need to focus on and just you know think about the, the purpose behind it, which is the food for me. For other people, it's different things, but you know, pretty much you have to you have to kind of draw a line somewhere, pretty much. Yeah, no, I, um, I think that it's a, you know for Twitter uh, and Facebook, uh, it's a it's a fantastic way of uh, uh, exchanging knowledge, um, and uh, that's a way of doing it. You know, when I started um, using Twitter, uh, probably th uh, three years ago. Um, when I was writing my book, um, I had a lot of time and I was doing a lot of uh, research and uh, Twitter was a way for me to, uh, to put some information out there that I was coming across and, uh, and you know, make it available, you know, and, you know, people really liked that and, and, and uh, you know, I would get feedback and, and you know, they would, they would bring some, uh, some other information I didn't know and I thought that that exchange was, was, um, was very good. Um, and I got to meet people um, uh, in real life and also uh, um, on Twitter um, that I wouldn't have met otherwise, um, including uh, Chef Rick Tramonto, who, who, um, who I was um, following on Twitter and he followed me back. And, uh, and one day I asked him, um, um, hey Chef, um, I'm writing a book, do you mind writing the foreword? You know, you know, when you're when you're behind your computer screen, you know, you you know, you kind of have the balls to ask a great <laughs> chef uh, some things you wouldn't if it was in front of you. And he said, "Yeah, okay, I'll do it." And uh, and he did, you know. Um, so uh, I spent a lot of time, uh, maybe too much time, uh, on Twitter about three years ago. Um, I kind of stopped when uh, my ex-wife um, <laughs> took um, my Twitter uh, timeline and brought it to uh, uh, to divorce court. And um, <laughs> and uh, uh, that's a negative sign. Yeah, <laughs> and um, you know I got busted for some things. You know, being at one place instead of the other, and uh, and uh, that's where all these French guys. <laughs> You can, That's you can turn off that location setting. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And that's when uh, when I stopped using Twitter, you know, and um, and um, so so yeah, you know, double-edged uh, sword there, you know. And it's uh, quite a double-edged sword. Yeah. Uh, okay, well, this is the last question I'm going to throw out there and then we'll open it up to the audience and it's kind of been uh, talked about a little bit here, but you know, Chad's talking about hydrocolloids. I don't even know what the heck those are, you know. Uh, the, let's let's talk a little bit about the 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 whole molecular gastronomy uh, approach. And you know, for those of us who cook at home, um, how can we people who don't know what a hydrocolloid is? How can we apply these sort of things uh, at home? All of the techniques that that some of you are are using in your kitchens. Marcel, you want to start off at, at, with that one? You love like throwing the new questions at me. Um, sure, no, absolutely. Uh, polymers, they're, they're polymers. Um, hydrocolloids, essentially, I mean, Chad's can probably elaborate on this better than I can, but um, essentially they have the ability to um, control water. I mean, there's a lot of different things that they do. Um, and they're in a lot of different products that you would see in the grocery store. For example, any sort of vinaigrette that you would see at the grocery store, like Newman's or you know Caesar or Balsamic, um, has uh, xanthan gum in it. Um, xanthan gum is an example of a hydrocolloid. Uh, locust bean, guar gum, gelin, agar agar. Um, all of those are hydrocolloids, essentially. And they all basically have the ability to control water. Um, some of them increase the viscosity, some of them emulsify. Um, xanthan gum, for example, actually does both. Um, and it, you, know, you use it for different things, for different reasons. But um, essentially, I mean, they're just uh, ingredients, right? It's uh, the, the modern pantry, 
you know. Um, and they've existed, you know, in the commercial food sector, food service industry, um, you know, for centuries. I think uh, people in Japan have been using agar agar since kind of like the dawn of time. Um, and I think there's a there's a sort of, I don't know, like a big misnomer. I think a lot of people don't really understand, I think, what hydrocolloids are and where they come from. I mean, if you say the word chemical, it's like, oh, no, chemical, they're bad, bad for me, get away, chemical. Um, but in actuality, I mean, agar-agar is derived from algae, right, seaweed. So uh, everybody knows how bad spirulina is for you these days. Like, Damn spirulina, just got to get that out of my diet. Um, and, I mean... A lot of them are all derived, the majority of them are all derived from um, organic compounds. So if you look at lecithin, right, which is one of the ways that we make airs or foams, um, lecithin is most frequently derived from soybeans. Um, and it's actually, I frequently buy it in the health food store, and it says like right on the label, like, will boost immune system. Um, so it's actually also really good for you. Um, but yeah, I think a lot, of the, a lot of these different hydrocolloids, you know, um, can be used for a variety of different reasons and are all sourced from, you know, different, different products. Um, and it's, you know, it's kind of like using salt, for example, but you just have to know the right application um, with the right ingredient. And I mean, there's a million different ways you can use them at home, um, whether it's, you know, by making a simple, like, lemon vinaigrette and, you know, wanting to have it actually have a little bit of viscosity so it coats your lettuce instead of just running off. So just add like a little pinch of xanthan gum into your olive oil and your lemon juice and now all of a sudden you have like, you know, a sexy, viscous vinaigrette that's completely emulsified and you can totally show off to all your friends be like, yeah, I didn't buy Paul Newman's vinaigrette, I made my own, my own xanthan gum. <laughs> Um, and it's really simple, just like sprinkle and whisk or, you know, use an immersion blender or um, something of that nature. But, I mean, that's, that's one simple way you could use the postmodern pantry in your own personal home kitchen. So I like the term postmodern pantry, by the way. That's, a, that's got a nice ring to it. Yeah. Um, um, that one's not mine, by the way. Uh, yeah. uh, the, the molecular gastronomy or modern cuisine or, or kind of whatever term you want to throw at it, it's really the concept of using uh, a lot of, you know, the things that um, are out of the, the postmodern pantry. Um, from, from a science point of view, um, you know, a lot of the modern cuisine stuff is looking at what we've learned from science and doing it in new and novel ways. Uh, and that's, you know, fun and interesting. Um, if some of the ingredients um, that Marcel mentioned are maybe a little more exotic, um, cornstarch is actually a, kind of a common hydrocolloid. I mean, hydrocolloid itself just means hydro is, is water, and colloid refers to um, a suspension of liquid and solid. So if you think about lemon meringue pie, that's a hydrocolloid using cornstarch. So uh, familiarity with ingredients is really, I think, probably one of the biggest barriers that a lot of the modernist cuisine people have had, in that you have all these exotic, weird sounding things you're not familiar with. But you know, it wasn't that long ago that baking powder and baking soda were exotic modern ingredients you know, go back to the mid-1800s, and agar-agar, you know, the Japanese using it in the 16th century. You know, it's, it's a question of being familiar with some of these things. Um, you know, you do run into issues of new foods, um, how much of them, dosage, you know, too much salt will, will kill you. The lethal dosage of salt is about 83 grams. It's about how much you can fit on a, you know, shaker on top of your table at a restaurant. Um, so, I mean, a lot of these things come down to familiarity and understanding what they do and how they work. Um, but they're definitely fun to play with. I think Jeff's response on that and kind of led into the area I was going to go. I think a, a lot of the fear or um, kind of hesitation people have about these ingredients when they hear about them is because they sound like chemicals on, listed on the ingredients in the store where you don't know what it is, so you're immediately thinking it's a chemical, it's preserved, it's bad for me. But um, like uh, hydrocolloid, I mean, flowers, everybody uses that. Who cooks? Flour is a hydrocolloid, obviously. Um, it could be suspended in water, thick of things. Jeff mentioned the cornstarch. You know, like uh, maybe 50, 60 years ago, cornstarch was kind of a new ingredient. You know, some people, I don't know, I wasn't around then, so I don't know how people reacted to it, but you know, everybody uses cornstarch these days to thicken up gravies or whatever you're doing, or if you're making a pie, you're gonna put the cornstarch in it. Um, so I think it's just a lot with the name, it's maybe, maybe molecular gastronomy, and in, in a sense, a lot of chefs that embraced it at first liked the idea of the science edge to it and kind of adapted it, but in the same, in the same page that maybe alienated other people towards it, made it seem like, oh, it's not real food, or it's too more science than food. 
but food and science are, are so related. I mean, everything, every industry is affected by science and technology today, what, no matter what you're doing, what your job is. So it only makes sense that why should food stay in the dark ages because, you know, just because, you know, people have apprehensions about it. It's, and, you know, like Marcel mentioned the xanthan gum and the dressings. You know, we just opened a new outlet at our restaurant and um, at our resort on the beach. And a lot of dressings we're doing trying to streamline and make it more consistent, you know, like just adding a little xanthan gum to recipes is more like that store-bought texture or clingability. Um, and people eat it. They don't know they're getting it. But, you know, I'm not saying, like, we're slipping in bad stuff because it's not bad. It's, it's, all, it's all natural. It's all made from either seaweeds or, um, or fermentation, fermentative reactions or, or whatnot. Um, but just if it makes the food better, as my point was before, then then why not embrace that and take it instead of the guy 60 years ago said, I'm not going to use cornstarch. I mean, what, what the hell is that, you know? So I think I think it's just being more open minded and maybe just looking past those those words that may sound kind of maybe evil when you're thinking about them in their food, in your food. And they're really not bad. It's, it, yeah. And really, I think what happened, I, a lot of modern chefs now say, I go to a store and I look at the ingredients on things. And I know what everyone is there for and what it does. And I know if it's something I want or if I don't. So if it, if it makes you more aware, then that's a good thing, you know. I, I would add as a suggestion, if you ever come across an ingredient in a label you're not sure of, Google it. Seriously, just go search and, and learn what it is. That's yeah. probably to, the best tip I can give you. Uh, to go back to, uh, to what Ch Chad was, um, was saying, the, um, last year um, I've done a lot of uh, um, speaking at uh, chef conferences, you know, and I was surprised to see how uh, the chef community was divided on that whole uh, avant-garde cuisine thing, you know, because um, uh, you know, half of them was for it and half of them was um, against it, you know. And you know, it kind of um, reminded me of um, of uh, when Nouvelle Cuisine came about, uh, you know, um, at the beginning of the uh, went to, uh, to school in 1986, and uh, um, Nouvelle Cuisine was 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 there, and you know, all those chefs, you know, started to uh, to break away from uh, you know more classic cuisine, and uh, they started to put you know food on the plate. The bigger plate, the better. A tiny little portion, using kind of that um, uh, you know space, and using new, new techniques like you know presenting um, uh, vegetables that were uh, 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 you know crisp and fresh, and you know that was a new idea back uh, uh, in the 80s. You know, um, and that was kind of like um, you know looked upon as 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 crazy or, or mm. bre breaking away from um, tradition. You know, but now uh, you know 20, 30, um, 30 years later, it's completely accepted. You know, and now that the next movement uh, has come, you know, it's not nouvelle cuisine because you know nouvel um, the food that you know most people were doing at least before before uh, avant-garde cuisine was some kind of a, of a variation of nouvelle cuisine. You know, and now, uh, like Chad said um, at the beginning of the of the uh, of the discussion there, um, there's a um, there's a um, there's kind of like you know a, a new a new form a new movement you know but that's that's a good thing and I think that the technique of, of uh, avant-garde cuisine are being integrated uh, in what the chefs do and you know tomorrow on what people are going to do um, at home okay so it's just like a new set of uh, of uh, techniques you know that's all one thing like in um, I have a salad dressing called coffee molasses vinaigrette recipe and you know, I try to write books like Susie and Topeka's can be able to understand what it is I'm saying. And so, you know, <coughs> instead of, you know, I might use uh, just fruit pectin, like sure gel that Susie and Topeka yeah. would use when she's making jelly to keep the dressing emulsified. But I think even in my work with writing for home cooks that I'm inspired and, and try to take a lot of these things and make it so that it's something that they can buy off the shelf in the grocery store but still using those techniques and I find it really inspiring to also try to translate that down to you know that homemaker Susie homemaker That's a good point. thank you all for uh, coming um, They'll, they'll all be outside with their books. I know that they'd uh, love to answer perhaps any other further questions. Thanks so much for being here today, and thanks to our panel. Thank you.